morning, apparently, the subject or the issue at hand is the promise of God. And the bulletin insert from Focus on the Family asks the big question, what's a promise worth? Only as good as the one given it. And he gives, shares his frustrations of broken promises from his father, but when his father honored his promise, how it enlightened his heart and made it joyful. And you read through the bulletin or the brochure, and it comes to reflecting on God's faithfulness. In the middle paragraph says, the faithfulness of God is foundational to our faith. If we can't trust what the, he says in the Bible, we have no reason to believe. If he doesn't keep his word, then our salvation is shaky and our hope is empty. But if God does fulfill his promises, then our faith is meaningful and our eternal destiny is secure. And I can assure you that he keeps his promises. That being said, we're in Exodus chapter 3 where God makes a promise to Moses. He says a promise to Moses and it really encourages my heart. When Moses is nervous and will read it, certainly I will be with you always. And then he later, it's just an exciting passage. Little did I realize how enjoyable it would be as preparation was made for the message. The title is, Who or Who? W, capital W, small letter H-O, or all capitals, W-H-O. You say, what are you even thinking about? And there's a phrase in verse chapter 3, verse 14, that is incredible. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. When you ask the question, who can help me? Who can save me? Who can take care of this situation? Who can? I am who. God Almighty can fix every situation in your life. So the passage is like this. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he left the flock to the back, led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of the fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near to this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to, all the, to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with them which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to favor that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh? and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he said, What? I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you, and you, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel to say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, this, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, thus shall you say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. We have a great God who has given an assignment to Moses, and Moses had little idea what that might involve. 
And how do we respond when God calls us to do things we don't know that we can do or have the capabilities to do? God, you would want me to do that? Or when David went up against Goliath, when Esther was standing in the palace, when the pe- re- he, all the scriptural illustrations had big responsibilities given to them by God. And when God has something for you to do, he's generally taking you to a higher level of commitment. Will you trust me? Gideon, when he narrowed his army of 10,000 down to 300, it wasn't just to be arrogant, it was to get Gideon to put his trust in him. When Joshua had to lead the Israelites around Jericho, it wasn't to demonstrate Joshua's great military might, it was for them to trust God and what he has said. So the bottom issue here is when God was prod you to do something, the right response is to trust God and do it. And you can trust him because he gives these promises, the same ones he gave to Moses, that he would be with us. He said in Deuteronomy, and he said in Hebrews chapter 13, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You will never be alone as a Christian. He will always be with you. And if God is with you, you will be okay. And if whatever happens, if it is the worst thing you can think can happen in life, which is death, most of the time we think that, It's a transition right into the place he has prepared for you. He has promised to go with us, and when we're up against these situations and responsibilities given to us, we can have this confidence. So is it who am I or I am who? If you're putting your confidence in yourself and all your capabilities and resources and talents and all that, you're not going to make it through every struggle and situation in life. But the moment you realize that you can put your confidence in the I am, the who, you can make it. And you can, and that's where we need to put our focus. So we're going to look at the first who am I. When Moses poses that question, first thing he realized was his deficiencies. If we're honest, we all have shortcomings and things that we just are not capable of doing. And where it's from personality issues to things that we think that we can't do, insecurity, whatever you're, whatever reasoning you're giving, Moses recognized his inabilities. First, you know, when I look at this situation, there's so many things in the text. You can see his humility. Can you imagine the situation? How do I see his humility? Well, look at verse 1. He is tending the sheep of his father-in-law. Where is he tending them? In the backside of the desert. Class, would you pick a life in the backside of the desert? No. Would you care to tend your father-in-law's sheep? No. Would you care to be a shepherd when you lived a life in the palace as a teenager? No. There is humility seen in the life of Moses before you even get down into the, the chapter. And you know Moses ended up being known as the meekest man that ever lived. And that's just because meekness is not weakness, it's power under control. It's when you realize that, hey, there is someone smarter than me. There is someone who can do things better, but I I don't put my confidence in myself, I'm putting it in God. That's when meekness comes into play. When you realize, as Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And that's where you can find the victory. So you see his humility even in verse 1, his humanness in verse 2 and 3. He sees a bush on fire and wonders why it doesn't burn up. Well, it wasn't uncommon for bushes to catch on fire in the desert. I think of the tumbleweeds and stuff out west. I guess they catch on fire. Do you ever light a Christmas tree that you had from Christmas? In about February, you light it. It just goes fast. You know, it doesn't burn it all up, but it gets rid of all the pine needles real fast, and then it's all over. Well, that's the same way that he would be used to seeing that when something would catch on fire, it burns up, and it's gone. But this thing was burning, and it didn't burn up. And he had to check that out. And when he goes, can you imagine the thoughts going through his mind? Am I losing my, has this back desert heat, or these sheep got to me, or whatever the situation is? He goes over to that bush, and it speaks to him. I think that's almost funny that Moses is talking to a bush. He really wasn't talking to a bush. He was talking to God. And how does God start the conversation? What's the bush say, class? I read it. Are you not paying attention? 
What's it say? Don't come near. And what was the first thing it said? Moses, right? Moses, Moses. Well, wasn't that something? They got to know each other that long in the backside of the desert. Hi, Mr. Tumbleweed. How are you today, Frank? No, that's not how that was. God knows us by name. And he knows exactly who he is speaking to and what he wants them to do. Do you know that God still speaks to us and he's still speaking to you? You better, if you haven't heard him, you need to listen. How does he speak? Through his word, through his spirit. He'll use circumstances. He will use some, you know, confirmation some other way. I know exactly this morning that this was the theme of the day, standing on his promises he just confirmed it over and over and over, and it wasn't nothing orchestrated before we planned this out. It was God putting it all together. I don't know what Karen picked. David, he, he shared with me that they were playing that Wednesday night, and I didn't even connect the dots till this morning when they put the treadmill on and the radio started playing, standing on the promises. Well, that's just pretty clear that it's about the promises of God. What did God promise Moses to accomplish the task that he had him to do? He promised he would never leave him. And he said that he would accomplish it. And he said, this will be a sign to you. When you do this, you will worship on this mountain. Is that not saying I'm going to get you back from your project that I have assigned you to do? The same thing he told the disciples when they got into the boat. We're going over to the other side. Well, they got in the middle of a storm and they lost hope. They said, don't you care we're going to die and drown out here? And if they would have remembered that he said they were going over to the other side. All right, class. He promised us that he would take us to the place that he prepared. Is he going to do that someday? Yes, absolutely. You're going to go see his presence as a believer. He didn't tell us exactly how that would happen. It might be the way of the grave. It may be in the clouds when he calls his bride home. If you hear David Pollock playing the organ, it's probably he called me home because I don't think he's going to play till I die. I said, I'd like to hear that sometime, and I've been waiting about three or four years. So if I ever see David on the organ, I'm going out the door and sitting because uh, I think I'm going home. You know how that works. But, you know, you have a promise from God that he'll sustain us and take us. He realized his deficiency. He shows that through his humility, through his humanness, and through, you know, he was even showing that he honored God because he said, he answered, here am I. That's the best thing you can say when God wants you to do something. Okay, I'll do what I can through, with your help. There are situations when that's all you got. You know, you get asked to do something that is out of your comfort zone and, and you are called to a situation where you don't think you'll be adequate to, at all. And you just say, okay, God, this is yours. Like David said, the battle's not mine, it is the Lord's. Do you think that he was confident of the outcome? Just about as much as you and I would have been. He knew that he, he had practiced and he knew that he could kill something with a slingshot, but God knows the end. And he was willing to do what God instructed him to do. And that puts it in our arena in a few minutes. But you have his humanness, his honor, he respected him, his response. When he was told to take off his shoes and to stay back, he obeyed. Then there was a reassured deliverance in verses 7 to 10. He recognizes deficiencies, there is a reassured deliverance. If God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen, period. There is nobody can thwart the plans of God. I don't care how powerful you are. Do you think that Nero didn't think he was powerful? And if you don't think some of the mother world, Herod thought he was the most powerful? No, you can't override God's plan. I don't care who you are. And what was the motivation of God's plan? I underlined some words in my text. I underlined the words seen, heard, know. He saw their dilemma. He heard their cry. And he knew their sorrows. Does God care about your situation and your hurts? Does, is he touched with the feeling of your infirmities as he said he is? He weeps with those that weep. And he cries with those that cries. And he mourns with those that mourn. He also rejoices with those that rejoice. And he wants the best for your life. He gave his best so you could have life. He gave his life so that we can have it. 
God sees the need and he responds. I see the need. I heard their cry. He still answers prayer. He started way back in the Old Testament days and he's still answering prayers today. If you haven't experienced answered prayer, there's probably one main reason you haven't been praying. And if you didn't get to praying and you still don't get answered prayer, then look within your heart to make sure it's fixed towards him. And it's not some selfish thing because God still hears and answers prayer. And he says he knows their sorrows. Because of those situations, his seeing, his hearing, his knowing, he makes a response in verse 8. I have come down to deliver them. It doesn't make sense. He, yeah, it does make sense. He comes down to incorporate Moses into a program that he wants fulfilled. Anytime that he is calling you to do something for him, he is showing his deity through humanity, the vessels that he chooses to extend his kingdom. He come down and made this contact with Moses to bring him out of the land of Egypt in their bondage. Moses was the right guy for the job. Do you know when God picks the person, it's the right guy for the job? You say, I don't know why God picked me, because you're the right guy for the job. And it might be in your family arena, it might be in your little neighborhood or community, you're the right person for that job. Moses had a pretty good upbringing to prepare him for that. Do you not think that living in the palace of Pharaoh would have helped him have access to the Pharaoh? Do you not think knowing their language would have helped? Do you not think that God sparing his life as an infant would not help him think, i got to do something for these people? There's all kinds of things that God prepared him for. And and do you think that tending the sheep was wasted time in the desert? He knew the desert like the back of his hand. He could lead those people in the wilderness. He didn't know they were going to be stuck there 40 years. God didn't explain the whole program to them that day out of the bush. Aren't you glad that God didn't explain the whole program to you on day one? You accept the Lord as your Savior and say, okay, God, I'll do what you want me to do. Aren't you, I mean, us older folk that look back are pretty glad that we didn't know that. Clifford, you've been married 63 years. Aren't you glad God didn't explain all the things you'd go through then? (laughs) It'd be pretty frightful. Exactly. He knows what we can take when we can take it. But we can trust him. And, you know, we put that in a relationship. You put it in the big program. The Apostle Paul, if he would have told him on the road to Damascus that you're going to be shipwrecked three times and beaten and put in prison and you're going to have a problem with Peter and there's going to be a... He just said, I'm out. But at the end of the story, he was thankful that he did it. I have fought, I have finished, I have kept. God is a good God to shield us from the unknown, and he prepares us and provides for the, the present, and he also gave us the future. In our own lives, we better be glad that we don't know exactly what lies ahead. So you see his, his reluctance in his decision. What's the first thing he offers up? Well, first he needs to clarify, who am I supposed to say sent me? That, as we were talking, me and Chris, about this, we didn't know how much, how much, how strong his relationship was with God at, to that moment. Because he should have known his name, and he should have recognized him, but that's just all things that you, aren't you glad the Bible allows you to think about some things? But he's reluctant about his decision. He says, who am I? Who shall I tell them sent me? What is his name? You say, well, that's not really reluctant. Well, you just have to read on and go to chapter 4, verse 1. He says, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they will say the Lord has not appeared to you. He gets into that unknown arena. What if they don't want to hear from me? The supposition, quit reading into it. If God has prepared a plan in a way, he can work it out. And it gets bigger than that. Finally, Moses starts saying, I, don't, I can't speak, I'm not a man of eloquency, and blah, blah, blah. Finally, he gives him Aaron, and Aaron, you know, he get, puts his confidence in that, and Aaron was such a blessing to him. No, Aaron, it was not such a blessing. You can read on for yourself. Who am I? Then the, the, the exciting verses to me are verses 13 to 15, whenever God declares, I am who? I'm tempted to take on that 
I'm definitely committing it to memory, chapter 3, verse 14. And that's easy to remember. 314 is pi r square and pi r round. And I like, I can remember 314. I am who. When someone wants to question who can do that or who is able, who can supply such a need? Yeah, who can? God is who can. And he is able, Ephesians 3, 18, 19, 20. He is able because it's his establishment. In verses 13, when he says, you know, when he asked the question, what shall I say to them? What is his name? And, Jesus, and God responded, I am who I am. In that statement, he's declaring his deity. He's self-sustained. None of us are self-sustained. We need God every day of our life to distribute the oxygen we need into our body, to process the food that we have and put it into nourishment, to protect us from the heat of the world. For all the th we need God more than we ever want to acknowledge. He doesn't need us. He created us for a purpose and to have fellowship with him. So it's his establishment. There is no higher authority. And this should give Moses confidence because he's going representing the highest authority there is. A police officer is representing the authority of the laws of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. They are under that authority. When they're coming to you and giving you that citation, they have the power to do that. And, you know, I have the authority of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to marry a couple. And I, ha I, mean, I sign off whenever that happens on behalf with their authority. And I'm representing someone else. Moses is representing God to Pharaoh. And under his authority, you are under the highest authority there is. The creator of the world. Not only does he declare that by saying, I am who I am. He declares it saying about his faithfulness and his past record. The God of your father is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And you can look at his faithfulness as credentials for your promise and his endurance. So, and his endurance is mentioned in the last part of verse 15. This is my name, how long? Forever. He is always going to be the Almighty, the I Am. And you got to draw a consolation in that. What is its effectiveness? And this is my memorial to all generations. God is still the same. Miracles still happen. He still changes lives. He still calms storms. He is always faithful. So remember who you are and whose you are. If you are his and he is guiding, you'll have success and victory in life. Moses had obstacles and situations after situation, but he had a God that never failed. He could brought water from the rocks. He made manna every morning. He produced quail to their nostrils. He did Things exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. Did he quit that at the end of Genesis and Exodus? No. He's still doing that. And if you haven't seen him do it in your life, get to know him better. Because he is still the same God. Is it who? Little who. Me. Or is it him? The one who really is in charge. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its promises. And little do we know it that sometimes we are an answer to someone's prayer. As the children of Israel cried for deliverance, you chose Moses to respond. As people in our world cry for help and encouragement, you choose us to respond. Help us to be willing. Help us to be obedient. Because you'll get the glory. It is your battle. It is your world. Thank you, God, for those opportunities. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.